a study of the social and economic conditions in the subcontinent during the Mauryan times. It is true that we can offer only an imperfect picture of the social economic conditions as many of the documentations on this subject are only paltry and fragmented. The traditional Indian society is often viewed in the form of the Varna Jati system. This is also seen in the Arthashastra of Kautilya, who as a Brahmanical thinker also strongly emphasizes on the continuation and perpetuation of the fourfold Varna divided society, that is, a society that recognizes the existence of the Brahmanas and the Kshatriyas as the two upper Varnas dominating over the two lower orders, the Vaishyas and the Shudras. Kautilya very strongly recommends the upholding and perpetuation of the institution of these four Varnas and also emphasizes on the maintenance of the four ashrama institution that is a person should ideally pass through the stages of life one after the other from brahmacharya the days of studentship to garhasthya that is the life of the householder then retirement to forest banaprastha and finally sannyasa or renunciation now, how far such strict fourfold Varna division in the society during the Maurya times was actually in practice is a moot question. Take, for example, the Mauryas had a Brahmana commander in chief, Pushyamitra Sunga who actually overthrew the last known Maurya ruler Brihadratha and established a new ruling house. So, the historical evidence goes to show that a Brahmana in fact could take up the business of arms, contrary to the strict code of conduct laid down in the Shastric text like the Artha Shastra. It is also interesting to know that Though the Brahmanas are mentioned in Ashoka's inscriptions, there is no other references to the other Varnas and even the term Jati does not occur in the entire range of Ashoka's inscriptions. By this, we do not entirely rule out the possibility of the prevalence of many Jatis and other Varnas. It is possible that the very large number of occupational groups, a number of tribal groups could have been gradually incorporated within the Jati system. And as Jatis in the typical orthodox Brahminical society, it is unlikely that such Jatis would be given a high social ranking. The sharply differentiated stratified society also looms large in Ashoka's inscriptions. Ashoka is not only aware of the existence of the high Varna Brahmanas, but also he is aware of the presence of the well to do people along with the miserly, the poor, the weak. He is aware of the existence of slaves and servants. So, even from the cursory glance of such terms in Ashoka's edicts, one gets an image of a sharply stratified society. If we at this stage turn our attention to the description of Megasthenes about Indian society, we come across something quite unusual. In his view Indian society was divided into seven groups. 
the term used by Megasthenes to denote the seven divisions is genos and meros in Greek. And none of these terms can be equated with what we mean by nowadays a caste. But what are these seven groups? According to Megasthenes, philosophers, both the Brahmanas and the Shramanas, the cultivators, shepherds, knitters, hunters, the artisans and dealers, the soldiers, spies, counsellors and assessors. It's quite clear the list is quite unusual and definitely makes a departure from the usual description of the society being divided into four Varnas and many Jatis. Of these seven groups, except the philosophers, no other person could change one's profession and nobody could marry outside his own group. Now that these two restrictions, restrictions on change of profession, restrictions on Indian marriage are typical features of the Varnajati system. Did Megasthenes ultimately indicate here two features of the Indian Varnajati system? Yet his description hardly goes along with the typical Varnajati system. The other point is said that all these seven groups stand in relation to the state. Each and every group is described by Megasthenes how they are beneficial to the state and the king. If they do something beneficial for the state and the king, such group is exempted from taxes. Otherwise, they have to pay a taxes. This is something which makes Megasthenes' description quite distinctive and pretty unique. He did rightly observe that the largest number of Indian population were cultivators. He also made a very peculiar observation that the, the sixth social group formed of spies. He also indicated that the soldiers formed the second largest group, second only to the cultivators, indicating they are by the largeness of the Mauryan army. The account of Megasthenes, however, does not very clearly suggest how this group stood in relation to one another. That is, where they arranged in a hierarchic manner from the highest group to the lowest in social esteem or they stood one by one next to the other on a horizontal system. Usually the Indian Borno divided society maintains a very sharp vertical division of the society. Ashoka's queen Karubaki or Charubaki figures in one of the inscriptions. The inscription says that she was the mother of the prince Tivara. So here Karubaki is presented more as the mother of a prince than as an independent female personality. The Mauryan society is definitely a complex society, particularly because of the fact that the Mauryan material culture, that of economic life, is also complex and has various types of economic pursuits available during that time. The most important economic pursuit for the people in the Mauryan times was of course agriculture. There was varied and 
large amount of crops regularly produced in India during the Mauryan times. He attributes the diversity and the large amount of crops due to two factors. First, he says there were two rainy seasons and hence double cropping. The fertility of the soil is largely dependent because of the existence of a number of rivers. He appears to have been fairly conversant with the geographical and environmental scenario at least of North India and therefore makes this major uh, statement on agriculture, environment, rainfall pattern. What is interesting that normally in the Shastric texts, agriculture is considered to be the vocation of the Vaishyas. Kautilya once again makes an interesting departure from this. He categorically mentions that in the villages many Shudras also took to agriculture. Thus, the Shudras could pursue a vocation beyond the traditional activity of theirs, which according to Shastras is merely serving the three upper varnas. The Shudras in the Arthashastra is recognized as a cultivating group, as producers of food and this is something quite interesting uh, position Kautilya has taken. One of the most fundamental principles of agricultural activities in the Arthashastra is the policy of expansion of agrarian settlements, Janapada Nivesha, that is creation of new villages where none existed hitherto before. The term Janapada means a settled territory, settled by agriculturists. So, creation of new villages actually mean expansion of settlements into hitherto uncultivated, non-arable, barren, maybe forested tracts. According to Kautilya, this activity is so important that it should be uh, put to practice under state supervision and under the aegis of the state. Kautilya sometimes proposes at least a degree of the control of political and administrative authorities on different economic activities. Therefore, in the Arthashastra, there is the recommendation to appoint a director of agriculture, a state official, Sita Dhaksya. Sita meaning actually the royal or crown land. The Mauryas possibly took some interests in providing irrigation facilities to the cultivators. The classic example comes from Junagar area in Kathiawar, where an inscription slightly later date, 150 AD, remembers that a large reservoir named Sudarshana was originally constructed during the time of Chandragupta Maurya. The same reservoir was maintained by Ashoka. In fact, Ashoka is credited with providing conduits to the irrigation project, obviously for distribution of irrigation water to the nearby areas. Excavations at Kumrahar near Patna and also at Besnagar, which is close to Vidisha in Madhya Pradesh, they have revealed the existence of canals, obviously for uh, spreading irrigation facilities and these canals were constructed possibly during the Maurya period. These were obviously instances of large scale supralocal canal based irrigation which technologically, administratively, financially were beyond the means of a single individual or group of individuals. Here possibly the state authorities played their role. But the Arthashastra, which strongly advocates royal control over all setus or irrigation projects, however, recognizes that individuals could construct and maintain small scale local level irrigation projects like 
whales, coopers, and tanks, talagas. Moria period covers nearly the entire subcontinent, where everywhere you do not come across very fertile lands like the Ganga Valley. There are many areas where non agricultural activities were mainstays of the life of the people, particularly in areas which were not noted for their fertile soil. The non agricultural pursuits were in vogue, particularly in the realm of crafts and trade. The major crafts and industries of this period were so numerous that Megasthenes considered artisans to be one of the seven groups that he enlisted in the, his comments on Indian society. One of the best examples of the excellence of craftsmanship during the period of the Mauryas is the very large number of the northern black polished ware and excellent pottery with a typical mirrored like black polish at the outer surface of the pot and these were widely distributed in different regions of the Mauryan empire though the main area of their manufacturing is the middle Ganga plains that is essentially Bihar and eastern part of Uttar Pradesh. Obviously, these potteries were in great demand and transported to various parts of the Maurya empire from their main manufacturing area in Bihar and UP. One of the key areas according to the Arthashastra is the working out of mines and mineral resources. All mines are technically and theoretically under the control of the ruler because Akara mines and mineral resources are major assets for the ruling authority. Kautilya would recommend the appointment of the director of mining Akara Dhakshya including the production of salt which is considered as a mineral activity. We have already referred to the fact earlier that the maximum number of Ashoka's inscriptions are found from the minerally rich areas of Andhra and Karnataka where was stationed a very high ranking officer Aryaputra according to the Ashokan inscription. These areas yielded among other minerals gold. In fact, some of the Ashokan inscriptions lie close to the famous Kolar goldfield area. In recent times, researches by Orun Kumar Bishash informs us that for the first time zinc was manufactured and extracted from the ores in the Zawarmala mines in Rajasthan. The excavations at Zawarmala mines area indicate that the earliest possible working out of the uh, mines here for the extraction of zinc goes back to the Mauryan times. Zinc is important for the use of its alloying with copper and the alloy leads to the production of brass pittal. In fact, the earliest known brass artifact belongs to the Bhir Mound area of Taxila which belongs to the Mauryan period. All these would indicate considerable progress in the manufacturing techniques, particularly metal based technologies in the Mauryan times. Typical of Kautilya, he also recommends state supervision on the production of textiles and therefore recommends the appointment of a high ranking officer Sutra Dhakshya. Sutra meaning yarn. So, the officer in charge of the production of yarn is Sutra Dhakshya. He recommends the employment of female workers in the state textile manufactories. The very distribution of Ashoka's edicts over a very large area in the subcontinent, possibly the central message is emanating from Pataliputra, the Maurya capital to different corners of the vast empire. 
suggests even indirectly a communication pattern and some facilities of communication. If we add to this the fact that Ashoka introduced a system of official tour Anusamiyana either after every five years or after every three years. So the officials on tour must have followed certain established routes of communication. We have already indicated that Ashok himself went out on tours sometimes about 256 nights away from his capital. We find that there were officials according to Megasthenes called Astinomoi stationed at the capital Pataliputra, Palibotra, one of whose functions was to look after closely trade, commerce, merchants at the royal capital, including they used to check whether a merchant was mixing old things with new. Did Megasthenes try to imply that the Maurya state tried to prevent adulteration of items in the market? In fact, the Astinomoi class of officers were entitled to collect one-tenth of the proceeds of sale from the merchants. This is something like tolls and customs, shulka, which is levied upon trade and commerce. We may recall here that Kautilya recommends the appointment of the a high ranking officer in, the ch in charge of the collection of tolls and customs, Shulkad Dakshya. Similarly, Kautilya very strongly recommends the appointment of a high ranking officer, the director of trade and commerce, Pandyad Dakshya. I am not going into the details of the functions prescribed by Kautilya, the functions of Pandyad Dakshya as laid down by Kautilya. But he gives a maxim at the end of the chapter in Pandyad Dakshya. What is the ultimate function of the Pandyad Dakshya? The Pandyad Dakshya according to Kautilya should go wherever there is the prospect of profit and avoid the absence of profit. Yato lava stato gachet alavam parivarjayet. It will not be correct to assume that whatever is prescribed in the Arthashastra was actually put to practice. But the Mauryas possibly encouraged and facilitated movements of people along established routes of communication. If we once again turn to Megasthenes' description, he speaks of a particular type of officers called agronomoi. One of the functions of the agronomoi was to maintain a royal road and put distance markers, signals like present day mile posts after every 10 stadia. 10 stadia is a Greek measurement which corresponds to the present day half a mile. And this indicates that the Maurya's appointed officers who took care of highways. This description finds a striking corroboration in two edicts of Ashok coming from Lagman in Afghanistan. These are two edicts in Aramaic language and script. The two edicts tell us about the existence of a karapathy. The term kara is an Iranian word meaning the lord, the king and pathy is a Sanskrit word which means the way. If you combine the two it means a royal highway and the two Aramaic edicts at Lagman record the names of certain places and the distance and the direction of those places. In fact, these two are road registers. This very clearly shows 
that the Mauryas were alive to the requirements of the communication movement in the very large area under their control. After all, we cannot forget that during Ashoka's reign, he sent out missions of Dhamma, not only to different parts of his own realm, but also outside his realm to the areas of the Cholas, the Padas, the Satyaputas, Keralaputras and also to Sri Lanka. That he sent Dhamma missions to Sri Lanka is also celebrated in the later De Buddhist texts. On the other hand, we have already encountered in our earlier discussions how Ashoka sent Dhamma missions to the kingdoms of five Yavana kings in West Asia. The Mauryas maintained regular contacts with Greek rulers of West Asia, indicating that they were trying to maintain communication, possibly by overland routes to faraway West Asia. On the other hand, the communication to Sri Lanka must have been made by maritime routes. So the Mauryas tried to provide some facilities of communication even on a long distance basis, both by overland as well as by maritime routes. So here we come across in the study of the Mauryan social and economic life, a complex scenario, typical of a very large far-flung polity which was also very complex.